This is the Sony ZV-E1, the brand new budget full frame mirrorless camera in Sony's ever expanding lineup. It boasts a ton of new functionality in a small form factor, reduced price, and has loads of new software features, especially when it comes to image stabilization. Some have even touted it as a gimbal killer, but is it really, or is it just a gimmick? Let's find out. So Sony did send me the ZV-E1 to test out, but I received it a few weeks later than most, which means a few things. First, I didn't get invited to camera camp. Maybe my invite got lost in the mail, or maybe you should subscribe so I get an invite next year. Second, this means I got to spend longer with it than most folks here on YouTube, so I got to bring it on a few trips with me, and I got a sense of what it actually felt like to use it in a real-world scenario, not just sitting in a studio or reading off a spec sheet or using it at some super lame camp that I totally didn't want to go to. I'll also call out that Sony doesn't get to see this video before you do, they have no say in what I say, and this is not a sponsored video in any way. So let's first talk about the things that I was very pleasantly surprised by in shooting with this camera, including the gimbal killer functionality, and then I'll give a few warnings about things that I really didn't enjoy about this camera. First things first, it is incredibly lightweight at only 400 grams. It's super easy to bring with you everywhere, toss in a day bag, clip to your shoulder strap, and we're sort of in this era where there's a rise of everyday carry cameras, like the Leica Q or the Fuji X100 series cameras. In a sense, this is sort of a video forward version of that that you can bring with you absolutely everywhere. Another fantastic thing about the ZV-E1 is the image quality. It boasts the same image sensor as the A7S III or the FX3, so you get incredible image quality at 4K, 10-bit, 422 with no crop factor. Well, sort of, we'll get to that in just a minute. And it also has Sony's much improved color science. Like the A7S III and the FX3, it also has the dual base ISO of 640 and 12,800, meaning it handles high ISO and low light scenarios extremely well, like the best of any camera really. This is great because you can pair it with smaller lenses, which tend to have worse maximum apertures. So the ISO performance sort of compensates in areas where the lens maybe can't. Sony also jammed all of the best versions of their autofocus system into this tiny little camera. You've got human, animal, bird, insect, airplane detection. It's actually quite impressive how well this thing does at autofocusing. The thing that I have to compare most to is the human detection. Now it can lock onto a human if they're further away or if they're turned around away from the camera, rather than just if their face or eye is kind of like close up to the camera. Another thing that I am incredibly impressed by is the audio quality. There's the integrated microphone that actually sounds surprisingly good. So Johnny thinks that the built-in microphone is no good. So we're gonna try it out, see how it works. I bet you, to be honest, I bet you it's gonna work just fine. I've always found it a little bit of a drag to have a large shotgun mic or an XLR mic, and having a huge microphone also tends to get some unwanted attention and get you kicked out of places that you would maybe normally want to be filming. So having this integrated mic and this cute little audio wind protector thing is actually really great and gives you super clear audio without any of that hassle. Plus it even has the microphone detection settings to allow you to shift from omnidirectional to front weighted to rear weighted. Honestly, I know that these integrated mics are typically reserved for more of the budget friendly cameras, but I would personally love to see Sony implement something like this into something like the next version of the FX3 for really high quality scratch audio. You pair one of these with something like all of the different new AI audio processing tools and you're actually kind of golden. Now, all of this makes the camera quite impressive given the price point, but the image stabilization is arguably where the ZV-E1 shines the most. Not only does it have Sony's near top of the line five image, five axis image stabilization and active steady shot, but there's also the new dynamic active mode stabilization this uses AI recognition and the tracking system to auto crop in and then focus on a subject and keep it in the frame. This definitely takes some getting used to and requires some menu digging and tapping on the screen, but it does work quite well. You're able to perform moves that would normally require a gimbal without much effort at all. 
follow shots, orbits, profile tracking shots. You're able to accomplish all of these super easily, all while keeping the camera handheld. You obviously want to keep the camera as steady as possible, and it does introduce a very substantial crop on the image, but it is super impressive that you're able to get near gimbal level quality. Now, all these things are great and all, but by no means is this a perfect camera. There are loads of things about it that prevent it from being taken super seriously. Some of which are gimmicky, others are just downright annoying to deal with. The first is that the smaller build size leads to some lens imbalance. This is a full frame camera, which means that you pretty much need to pair it with Sony's full frame lenses. While there are a ton of different first party and third party lenses out there for the Sony E-mount nowadays, most are typically still built for an A7S or an FX size body. When you pair the ZV-E1 with full frame lenses, it can feel very imbalanced and awkward. Now, I mostly stuck with the 20 to 70 F4 G lens, which is one of my new all time favorite lenses. I did make a video on it recently, which I'll link to up there if you haven't checked it out already. The 20 to 70 G is on the lighter side and it does balance fairly well, but it is still a little bit front heavy. If you were to go with the ZV-E1, you'd probably wanna stick with something like an F4 Sony lens or maybe some of their smaller G series primes. You could also go with the Tamron zooms as well if you wanted to kind of have something that has a wider aperture that doesn't break the bank and is a little bit small and gives that zoom versatility. Another issue is that one of the best selling points, this crazy image stabilization that I was talking about, is potentially one of the bigger cons as well. While it works great when it works, I'll admit it doesn't always work. If your subject makes any sort of sudden movement or unexpected movement, the dynamic tracking will overcompensate and leave you with a really shaky, jerky motion. You'll also want to keep in mind that you're going to be experiencing a significant crop. When using this framing stabilizer with a 20 mil lens, the crop punches into around 35 mil. So you do lose a substantial portion of the space on the frame. There are also a couple of settings on the ZV-E1 that I find to be full on gag me gimmick. The first is the background defocus button. I understand that this camera is sort of targeting the folks who don't have a background in utilizing a DSLR or mirrorless style camera, but this button is just plain silly. It essentially just rapidly changes the aperture, which ends up wildly changing the exposure in most scenarios, and it ends up looking super cheap when used. There's also this cinematic vlog mode. When enabled, it actually disables a ton of functions. Thanks. Cinematic vlog. Thank you, cinematic vlog. It locks you in at 24 frames per second, swaps you over to S Cinetone, and adds these silly black bars onto your image. Generally speaking, I'd easily shrug it off and just not use it. However, the issue is that it's pretty prominently placed on the touch menu on the screen, basically at all times. And as I was hiking through the desert, I accidentally pressed it and didn't realize that I had fil mistakenly filmed a bunch of footage in this super silly mode. The worst part is that while it locks it at 24 frames per second, it doesn't simultaneously adjust your shutter to one over 50. So here I was filming in 60 frames per second at one over 125 shutter, and then unknowingly I tapped the cine vlog mode button and now I'm suddenly shutter cranking and have these weird black bars without even realizing it. Which brings me to one of my biggest pain points, the button layout. Now I get that this isn't priced like a professional camera. It's not a cinema camera like the FX3 or FX6, despite producing roughly the same image. Those are designed to be workhorses that don't require you digging into the menus. I get that. However, there are so few buttons on this thing and it has so much functionality that it is sometimes cumbersome to use. For instance, there is no mode button or mode dial, meaning each time you wanna switch the frame rate, you need to go into the menu, change the frame rate, then change the shutter speed. Compare that to almost every other Sony camera where there's a memory one, two, three, etc., where you can set all of your desired settings. Additionally, to use the aforementioned framing stabilizer, by default, you need to go into the function menu, switch to framing stabilizer, tap on the subject, 
then press the center button to lock it in. Now, yes, you can customize the function buttons, but regardless of how you set them up, you're going to spend far too long tapping on the screen, diving into the menu system. They do try to compensate for this by having the touch menu on the screen. But again, you'll likely be like me and accidentally press those touch options and you'll suddenly be in cinematic silly mode without even noticing it. So one other quick thing that I want to address is overheating. I know there's been a lot of flack given to folks on YouTube who were early testers of the camera and maybe weren't critical enough of the potential overheating concerns. Personally, I use this just like I would any other run and gun scenario of any other camera in the Utah desert. It got up to around 85 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like 30 degrees Celsius for all you crazy folks out there who think Celsius is better for some horrible reason. Regardless, I personally didn't experience any overheating issues, but I also wasn't using it for things like a long interview or something like that. All in all, I think the ZV-E1 is an incredibly interesting camera that I think a lot of folks would really enjoy. Maybe you're a photo forward shooter and you wanna start taking video more seriously. You have something like the Sony a7 IV and you wanna add a second camera for video. I think this could be the perfect companion. Maybe you're making money as a content creator and you want to improve your production quality without super break at the bank. I really don't think you could go wrong with the ZV-E1. Or maybe you're a more established creator and you want a smaller everyday carry camera to document everyday life. And you wanna do that with a more video focused lens. I could see myself doing just that, picking up one of these and the 20G prime lens and bringing that with me just about everywhere. I think that could probably even like fit in my pocket. Truthfully, I'm both excited and annoyed that they packed so much into this camera. I'd like to see Sony bring some of these software features like the new autofocus functions and these stabilization modes to their more existing pro line of cameras with just like firmware updates. But it is at least good to know that we'll continue to get great new features in future cameras. So if you like this video, be sure to play thumb more at the like button, subscribe, and while you're waiting for next week's video, I bet you like this one next. Peace.